So this video is mostly going to relate to how Rey is a Mary Sue, which is probably one of the most debated points of the sequel trilogy, and it's something I haven't really properly spoken about. Mostly because, well, what could I say that hasn't already been said? But then I realized I do have a way of putting down the shitty arguments sequel fans make where they inaccurately describe Star Wars lore and how Rey doesn't need training and not paying enough attention to the George Lucas Star Wars movies and thinking that Anakin and Luke had no training or whatever. The key point of Rey being a Mary Sue is how she uses the Force without training. And I've seen many people who don't understand the basics of the Force try to say this or that. Well, in this video, I'm going to prove once and for all how the Force works, how one taps into it, and so on and so forth, to the point where anyone trying to argue against me is either lying or continuing to express ignorance on the topic. So let's begin. Now, the first thing I'll do to win the argument and prove Rey is a Mary Sue is by using a quote from George Lucas said long, long, long before The Force Awakens. In the documentary, The Making of Star Wars, which aired on September 16th, 1977, George Lucas said, and I quote, The Force is a perception of the reality that exists around us. You have to come to learn it. It's not something you just get. It takes many, many years. Anyone who studied and worked hard could learn it, but you would have to do it. End quote. So case closed. The creator of Star Wars, in his own words, made it crystal fucking clear shortly after the first movie was released and continued to enforce throughout the franchise's history that training is required to become a Jedi. I could end the video right here, but I know there's going to be a lot of crappy counter arguments that sequel fans will make. The first of which being, George Lucas sold the right so he doesn't get to decide what's canon anymore. I've disputed this in other videos, but to do it again, because I need to hammer the point across, this is an incredibly narcissistic mindset to have because who owns Star Wars has absolutely nothing to do with how much one understands Star Wars. Disney is a corporation who's bought half of the fucking film industry at this point. So if you believe that Disney somehow dictates what Star Wars is and isn't after legally owning it, then I cease to take you seriously. Plus, I also have to bring up how George Lucas had no idea that Disney would practically ignore him at every turn after they bought it. And also the nuances of him selling it, like the incessant prequel hate that he was tired of, so none of this is actually as black and white as you think it is. The only person who understands a fictional work best is the creator of it. That is an absolute given. Plus, it's not like those who say George Lucas doesn't have a say anymore cared about what he thought while he owned Star Wars. So there's that crappy argument I hear constantly debunked. Another crappy argument I hear is that all stories are open to interpretation and what one writer writes on whatever franchise will obviously be different to another's and then they bring up art theory and all that crap. That's very cute but completely wrong. When you're writing a sequel to a story that isn't yours, you must absolutely understand the original author's work, and not doing so is inevitably going to lead to contradictions. Star Wars is not J.J. Abrams or Ryan Johnson's story. It's George Lucas's. And George Lucas would have written specific meanings to a story that are reflected in the story and not staying true to that is just disrespectful. If George Lucas says this is what Star Wars is, then that is an absolute given and is not open to change. Also, you're not seriously going to tell me that cloning being a secret only the Sith knew was just JJ's interpretation of the story, are you? This is why adhering to canon is absolutely important. Because otherwise you get dumb additions and contradictions like this. So that's the second most common excuse I always get to try and justify JJ and Ryan's lazy, inconsistent writing debunked. With both of those shitty arguments refuted, let me explain how the Force works and how Rey is definitely a Mary Sue, as well as explaining Luke and Anakin's story as well for comparison. 
So I think the easiest way to explain the Force is by discussing everything the sequel trilogy gets wrong. Let's start with the fact that Rey irrefutably needed training, but instead Rey just believed in the Force and reached out to it, which is not how the Force is meant to be used. How I know Rey believed in the Force is through J.J. Abrams, who expressed his faulty perspective on the Force by saying prior to The Force Awakens, and I quote, To me, Star Wars was never about science fiction. It was a spiritual story, and it was more of a fairy tale in that regard. For me, when I heard that Obi-Wan say that the Force surrounds us and binds us all together, there was no judgment about who you were. This is something that we could all access. Being strong with the Force didn't mean something scientific. It meant something spiritual. It meant someone who could believe. Someone who could reach down to the depths of your feelings and follow this primal energy was flowing through all of us. I mean, that was what was said in the first film. You need to clean your glasses. And there I am sitting in the theater at almost 11 years old and that was a powerful notion. And I think this is what your point was. We would like to believe that when shit gets serious, that you could harness that force. I was told surrounds not just some of us, but every living thing. And so, I really feel the assumption that any character needs to have inherited a certain number of metachlorians, or needs to be part of a bloodline. It's not that I don't believe that is part of the canon. You're a liar! You're a liar! You know something that you're not telling us, you slimy, scumbag liar! I'm just saying that at 11 years old, that wasn't where my heart was. And so I respect and adhere to the canon, but I also say that the forces always seem to me to be more inclusive and stronger than that. This obviously isn't the entire statement, but this is the part I highlighted to show that JJ is imposing what he believes the Force is based on his own interpretation with no backing in the films themselves over what is actually canon. I'll link the article in which this is said for the whole context, but JJ's words are very much expressed in the character of Rey. Rey is a character who did exactly this. She believed in the Force, which is not how this works. It would take Rey years for her to pull all the crazy shit that she did. This is why the interpretation argument is so pathetically weak. Because when you compare George Lucas's words and J.J. Abrams words, it's clear that the sequel trilogy is just a clusterfuck of visions and what the story actually is versus some idiot's interpretation of said story. In other words, a convoluted mishmash of characters, plots, and nonsense. This is not how the Force is meant to be used. And this is the first part of how The Force Awakens and the rest of the sequel trilogy completely misunderstand how The Force is meant to be used. I don't even want to get into The Last Jedi, but since I have to, let's start with the fact that Ryan Johnson is utterly clueless on what balance is and how the light and the dark side works. I've discussed that Ryan Johnson absolutely butchered Luke Skywalker. And one way he does this is by having Luke believe that if the Jedi come back, then and it's only going to lead to more misery. This idea is completely faulty. And to demonstrate how, I will brush over some basic lore. The Force has a will. Basically, the Force is kind of like a self-conscious being that knows greater than any one person. The Jedi, who practiced the light side, followed the will of the Force and let them guide it helped bring peace and prosperity to the galaxy. The Sith, on the other hand, by using the dark side, imposed their own will on the Force. There's a common misconception that the light and dark side are sort of like a yin-yang, when in actuality, the light side is the yin-yang, and the dark side is imbalance. It is impossible to, quote-unquote, balance the light side with the dark. The light side, on its own, is balance, while the dark side corrupts life around everything to anyone who uses it. The light side is essentially the side that adheres to the will of the force. The dark side has no will. Rather, those who use the dark side are imposing their own self-will on the force. It is utterly impossible to use the dark side for anything but evil. The dark side corrupts anyone who gives into it. There is no grey side of the force. In Knights of the Old Republic, that's just a game mechanic. So Luke, 
or any trained Jedi would never believe this. In Luke's circumstance, where he quit being a Jedi, he would understand that believing what he does in The Last Jedi would be utter lunacy and would completely neglect his understanding of the Force. People just use the excuse that, uh, Luke is framed as wrong in the movie. When this cheap shot does not excuse anything. It's like the excuse I got when I point out the line, let the past die. And the cheap shot I got as a retort is that Kylo Ren is the bad guy and thereby wrong. But given The Last Jedi doesn't even understand the Force and what makes good and evil in that universe and how nihilistic the whole film is, do you really have to go that far? to defend Ryan Johnson of all people. So that's the most basic way of shutting down Ryan's pretentious themes, given his themes completely misunderstand Star Wars. But one last thing before we move on to the rise of Skywalker. And that's how Luke Skywalker, after cutting himself off from the Force, magically uses it again in the power of Force projection. I could rant about this all day, but how it relates to this video is that it is completely wrong. That's not how the Force works. If one cuts themselves off from the Force, then it takes time to regain one's powers and shit over time, when they decide to use the Force again. Like in, say, Knights of the Old Republic 2, it took time for the Jedi Exile to regain her powers. And in case someone is going to complain that I'm sourcing an expanded universe work when it was already decanonized, I'm just going to point out that Ryan Johnson did the same thing to cover his own ass once. Alright, so now let's talk about The Rise of Skywalker. Given this is the movie that already retconned who Rey is related to or whatever, by having her have a grandfather in the form of the big bad Palpatine, there's a bunch of scenes that reflect how JJ has absolutely no clue what the hell he's writing. First example, when Rey accidentally uses Force Lightning. I'm going to point out to reinforce my earlier points that even the smallest taste of the dark side will make the user come back for more. That is an absolute given. Of course, since JJ and Ryan don't understand this, Rey might get angry or sad or whatever, but it's not drawing her closer to the dark side, despite the fact that it should be. This is one reason why Rey's arc is so pathetically weak in the sequels. Because JJ and Ryan will probably use their own self-imposed rules to contrive the plot rather than George Lucas's. But an example of her canonically using the dark side by actual Star Wars standards is when she uses Force Heal. Now obviously, a sequel fan is going to argue the opposite, that it's a humble light side power or whatever, and you are completely wrong. Go to your room. I've pointed out that in my Rise of Skywalker review, how Anakin all but gave everything up to save his wife and she died anyways. It's quite clear that Force Heal, as it exists, is a dark side power. He could actually save people from death. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be unnatural. Is it possible to learn this power? Not from a Jedi. Remember how I said the Force had a will? Well, sometimes the Force wills that people become one with the Force. By actual Star Wars standards, Rey was rejecting the will of the Force by bringing people back to life. But since the Rise of Skywalker is totally unaware of the will of the Force, the story is just a big confusing clusterfuck. Given the will of the Force doesn't even exist in the sequels, despite the fact that it should. So when Ben Solo resurrects Rey, for example, the film frames this as a noble sacrifice, given he dies right afterwards, but in actuality, he was using the dark side, which is what makes his shallow redemption even more shallow, because it wasn't written properly and with a keen misunderstanding of the Force. Also, I have to question why the Jedi Order didn't teach this ability if it was so damn important and easy as it looks to use. If this obviously not light side power was a light side power, which in turn rejects the will of the force for some reason. I mean, how the hell does this power even work? Like, apparently the excuse I got from sequel fans when I pointed out stuff like why Obi-Wan didn't heal Qui-Gon and practically save him from death was because Obi-Wan would have quote unquote killed himself in the process by giving up his life force. 
Like, in The Rise of Skywalker, there's a line from Rey after she heals the big lizard, where she says that she gave up some of her life force to do it. I don't get it. Also, Qui-Gon Jinn was not dead yet. He was still alive, clinging on to life. Just like Kylo Ren was when Rey stabbed him in the exact same spot without killing herself. So this life force bullshit doesn't put down the plot hole. Instead, it makes it burst out under pressure and explode even harder than the Tsar Bomba. Also, I don't recall this life force crap being a thing in The Mandalorian, which was released before The Rise of Skywalker, or at least the episode when it was first demonstrated. So are there actually penalties for Force Heal or not? Among the zillion other questions I have. Also, I wanted to talk about Force Dyads. The most retconny Force thingy ever forced into the Force ever. Force Dyads do not exist. Period. I looked into what a Force Dyad is supposed to be, and I almost had a mental meltdown because of it. Apparently, it's supposed to be some Force Bond that makes both people with the Bond one with the Force, which confuses me, because that's not how the Force works. On the Wikipedia article for Force Dyads, it also says that Force Heal is more possible with Force Dyads, where it allows one to resurrect the other in the Force Dyad, which of course is still a cop-out to justify this retcon. Disney have also tried to cram this Force Dyad bullshit into the prequel trilogy by saying that Darth Plagueis, of all people, tried to create a Force Dyad with Palpatine. Fuck me. Also, something that doesn't exactly correlate to this topic but sort of does, is cloning Force users. The Expanded Universe made it clear that cloning Force users was costly and risky, given many ended up insane. This was actually mentioned in the Force Unleashed 2 briefly, and it does not contradict anything. So by making a clone, it just confuses things, since Snoke was a perfectly engineered agent for Palpatine, who could use the Force without risk. Of anything. That's not how the Force works. Now, I wanted to discuss misconceptions that sequel fans try to spread when they say that both Anakin and Luke are Larry Stoots, either by not paying enough attention or having a fundamental misunderstanding of the story. Let's start with Anakin. I don't know how anyone could think Anakin is a Larry Stu, especially with the fact that Anakin is far from a winner at the end of the prequel trilogy. He's reckless, impulsive, impatient, angry, annoyed, and is generally unstable. But the main arguments I hear about Anakin being a Larry Stu are his impressive force potential. Completely ignoring that in The Phantom Menace, he's clearly established as the Chosen One with the highest connection to the Force, surpassing that of even Yoda. It's clearly explained that the Chosen One would have an unnaturally high connection to the Force, higher than that of any Jedi or Sith, but such a powerful Force adept is dangerous. People ignore that characters like Mace Windu did not like Anakin from first meeting him, all the way to his death. Even though he's important as the Chosen One, Anakin still had to earn his place. And also, the Jedi originally rejected his initiation into the Jedi Order for the most simple reason. He was too old. Anakin, if he was a Larry Stu, could have easily charmed the entire Jedi Council. I mean, it wouldn't destroy continuity with the original trilogy, given the prequels are prequels, but that would make things too easy for Anakin. Then we've got the one scene people point out with the cheap shot of saying Anakin is a Mary Sue. Without full context and without paying attention, they look at the space battle of Naboo and say, Aha! Did you prove Anakin is a Larry Stu? He brew up the Trade Federation ship on his own when he was 9 years old. But anyone who says that forgets a crucial part of this sequence. He didn't do this alone. On top of the other pilots who would have directed attention away from him, to an extent, R2-D2 was essentially assisting him during the battle. Anakin did not just accidentally himself during the battle. He had assistance from R2-D2, who assisted him and greatly helped him keep him out of harm's way. And as we saw earlier in the movie, R2-D2 was effective at keeping those he served out of harm's way. Context, context, 
context. Also, I noticed that a lot of people who hate the prequels but love the sequels make this argument for Anakin, which contradicts their statements about whiny Anakin and how he complains about shit all the time. So it's clear these people have no idea what a Larry Stu actually is. Now let's talk about Luke, also the subject of grave misunderstandings of the story. So from what I've gathered, people seem to not pay enough attention to the movie. So first, let's talk about A New Hope. People like to point out Luke Skywalker and friends surviving the Death Star, which is surrounded by stormtroopers and stuff, and at first that seems very Mary Sue-ish, but people who say this forget the fact Tarkin clearly explains after Luke and the crew escape from the Death Star that he meant to let them get away so they'd lead them to the location of the Rebel base. So of course they'd let him live. All the stormtroopers and those TIE fighters were just pretending to try and kill them. On a separate note, this also debunks the idea that stormtroopers are useless because they actually did what they were supposed to do. Next, let's talk about the Battle of Yavin. Obviously, the Empire was trying to kill Luke this time, so how does he survive? Well, first, he has experience as a pilot, unlike Rey. Luke references his skills as a pilot throughout the movie, and they hammer it home right before the Battle of Yavin, when Biggs explains it very, very bluntly. So bluntly, in fact, there's no way you could miss it. But people still do it and it's very annoying. So he does indeed have the training of a pilot. Now let's discuss the fact that Luke had to be saved by Han Solo right when he was about to be killed. Not exactly perfect there was he? Another misunderstood part of the movie is when Luke blows up the exhaust port without the targeting system. People who try to say Luke is using the force without training clearly did not even watch the movie. Earlier in the movie, we saw Obi-Wan, the mentor in the hero's journey structure, teach Luke the basics of the force. We even see Luke manage to deflect a couple of shots blind, which shows he did get training, albeit minor. Also, there's no time throughout the entire movie that Luke just uses advanced force skills, like force pulls or jumps or anything like that. Luke at the end of the first movie was using a basic force power, taught to him by Obi-Wan shortly before he died. So that's that crappy argument debunked. This movie that established many of the rules of the universe absolutely makes it clear that Luke needs training. Now let's talk about Empire Strikes Back. Given the time jump, which so many people don't notice, Luke has only gotten a little bit more of an understanding of how to use the Force than before. How is this possible without a mentor? Well, given the time jump, there's a gazillion different stories that could explain this. And also, Luke only barely progressed in the three-year gap. Not hard to buy, is it? We see Luke absolutely struggle to pull the lightsaber from the snow. And keep in mind, it's snow. Snow is not a solid element. So fuck off with this idea that he just pulls it off with no effort. Watch the movie. Next, he gets his training from Master Yoda, and he struggles even with this. He is impatient, he ignores both Obi-Wan and Yoda when they ask him to stay, because he wants to help his friends. He isn't able to pull the X-Wing out, compared to Rey, who, after maybe some useless lessons, they get the Force wrong from Luke, is able to lift several rocks that probably weigh more than the X-Wing in Empire Strikes Back. Then we've got the fight with Vader, and Vader kicks his ass and chops off his hand. Are you still going to try and tell me that Luke is a Mary Sue? Okay, now let's talk about Return of the Jedi. Luke with the training that he has, outwits Jabba the Hutt, and you can clearly see that the powers he uses nowhere near match Anakin in the prequels. Why? Because he got much less training than his father. When it comes to the final fight against Darth Vader, you might be thinking this is the part where you say gotcha, but in actuality, many seem to think that Luke beats Vader with no lightsaber training. In the third movie, he goes on to defeat Darth Vader without any formal lightsaber training whatsoever. Also, it's made quite clear that Vader is not giving it his all in this fight, otherwise Luke would have died instantly. You can tell this by how he's trying to taunt Luke and turn him to the dark side. He's holding back in the hopes that Luke will turn, 
But since he's trying to match Luke's level and taunt him, Luke eventually manages to defeat Darth Vader, which is obviously going to happen when you go easy on someone. Luke cuts off Vader's hand, and Luke considers killing his father when the Emperor tells him to do so. But he remembers his own hand was cut off, and refuses to give the Emperor the satisfaction he wants, that he is turned to the dark side. So what happens from there? Does Luke whoop the Emperor's ass like Rey did in The Rise of Skywalker? Nope. The Emperor nearly kills him, and the only thing Luke does is tremble in pain and plead his father to help him. So, Vader realizing he must help his son, picks up the Emperor and throws him off. It was Vader, or more so Anakin, who threw the Emperor off to his death when he was caught off guard. Not Luke. Luke just got electrocuted and pleaded for his father to help. Anyone who watched the original trilogy knows this already. And all of these people who are trying so hard to make Luke and Anakin out to be Larry Stews or having moments that don't make sense have not watched either trilogy properly. This is another reason the interpretation argument is a rather rubbish one. Because I find that this interpretation thing practically excuses any incompetent writing. Anyone who seriously tries to argue that Luke and Anakin are Larry Stews and akin to Rey are first of all lying through their teeth because they made no such complaint prior to The Force Awakens. In fact, with Anakin, they said quite the opposite. And second, you are fucking incorrect no matter how you spin it. So that is my thorough explanation on how the Force works. None of this is my interpretation. These are the rules set up by George Lucas and other writers who knew what the fuck they were doing. Even if the specifics on, say, cloning Jedi was decanonized, the alternative explanation we get is terrible. I know that there are other reasons Rey is a Mary Sue, like how she pilots the Millennium Falcon with no experience, but the bulk of how she's a Mary Sue comes down to how she uses the Force. Now to wrap this video up, here are my patrons on screen. As you can see, no one else is funding the Robert Charity. I'm JJ Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories for mystery boxes? We found you hiding, we found you lying, choking on the dark and sand. Your former glory, and all your stories, dragged and washed with eager hands. But oh.